Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're David and Tracy Freck, lead pastors of Church of the Harvest. We're really grateful you took the time to watch this rebroadcast of this past week's message at Church of the Harvest. Hey, it doesn't matter what time you're joining us. It could be in the middle of the night. It could be during the day. Mm -hmm. But we trust that the Word of God will minister to your spirit today and that there will be something that happens in your spirit that you've been longing for. Absolutely. We're committed to helping you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's why we provide this message in a format that you can watch anytime you like. So would you do something? Just don't watch it, but also think about how we can connect with you yes. and make a difference in your life. So take the time to send us an email, look at the description below for next steps. However we can engage you, it would be our privilege and our honor to do so. So come on into the service, experience the word, and let Jesus change your life. All right, you ready to get in the word? Okay, I'm, I'm going to whether you're ready or not. Um, we start, we're starting a new series today. It's called Pursuit. Now, uh, in June of this year, the Lord spoke uh, to me after some, you know, we all know kind of what we had to walk through for that short season, um, that we were to press into the church, we were to press into his presence, and we were to press into joy. And we've been trying to do that. We've been, we've been working towards those very goals. And, and so today we're going to really focus on pressing into his presence, pressing into his presence. Um, we have a promise, don't we? that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, even to the end. But if you were to be real honest with me, would you say, I sense that all the time? I feel that all the time? You might know it, but you don't always sense it. You don't always feel it. There might be times when you're wondering, where is God? You, you, hear, you hear the, the groanings of David in the Psalms saying, where are you, Lord? Why have you forsaken me? You even hear Jesus saying it. And so we, ha we have these, these moments in our lives as believers where we struggle with the idea of, is he with us? Well, we know by promise and by proclamation that he is, right? And he won't lie. He can't lie. So I'm confident that when I don't feel it, my faith can access it. My faith can appropriate it. My faith can say, he's here whether I recognize it or not, whether I feel it or not, he's here. Some of you might have walked in the room today and you felt the presence of God. Others of you walked in the room today and you're like, where's God? Right? And so how do we manage that or how do we understand that? Well, I believe the presence of God isn't just a faith thing, but it is an experiential thing. I believe that the presence of God, if he is truly manifest in his presence, in an environment, in your life, there's no way you cannot know it. There's no way that you can see that or experience that and wonder, where is God? I find it interesting that, that he, you know, Moses in his conversation with God while they're in the middle of the wilderness and they're having some uh, power struggles with the team and, and, and he, he, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my angel. I'm, gonna, I'm not going with you, but I'm going to send an angel and, and he's going he's gonna to lead you. And, and Moses, talking to God, right, says to him, you know, if you're not going, I ain't going. We just sang it a few minutes ago. If you're not going, if your presence doesn't go before us, then we don't want to be led out of this place. Now, they, they were not in a great place. They were in a desert place. They were in a wilderness place. But let me tell you something. It's better to be in a wilderness place with the manifest presence of God than a great place with no presence of God. And some of us, some of us find ourselves in places like this in our lives where, where man, things are hard and things are difficult, but you have this grace manifested because of the presence of God. You, ad you have this identifiable sense that God's with me even though things are difficult, even though things aren't working out well, even though things are a struggle right now. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about for the next little bit. Um, it's the subject of pursuit. So here's what Jeremiah says. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So there's a, 
there's a challenge here and there's a promise here. The challenge is, or the promise is, you will find me. You can find me. I can be found. I can be known. I can be experienced. Outside of just promise, I can be experienced, right? I can be realized in a manifest way in your life, but it's going to require something from me, which is I have to seek him. I have to pursue him with all my heart. I have to pursue him with all that's within me. In fact, the mandate of the scriptures, the great commandment is that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? So there's there's this sense of God has a desire to be pursued, that his response to this pursuit is to do just that, respond. But I would also say that we can't experience that without him initiating the pursuit. I can't just put it in my head, I'm going to go pursue God. God has to ignite something in me. God has to launch the aptitude and the capability to pursue. So it's authored by God. How How do I love God? Because I loved him first? No, because he loved me first. So my love response to God isn't because I found something in myself that wants to love God. No, I found something to love God because God deposited his love in me. And because of that, now I have an ability to pursue his love and to love him. So God initiates ultimately, right? So this whole series is going to ultimately be about the high call of a deep relationship and experience with God. A.W. Tozer, who wrote an incredible book called The Pursuit of God, which I would challenge any of you to read, uh, said this, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. And I would dare say that many of us are struggling with our spiritual growth, not because we can't grow, not because we don't have the tools to grow, but because of a simple spirit of complacency. Nobody amen me, but that's okay. We just get complacent. We just get kind of into rote ritualism in our spiritual life. And the consequence of that is, is that we don't grow. We're not, I just don't feel God like I used to feel him. I'm just not experiencing God like I used to experience him. I don't have a desire for God like I used to have a desire for God. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not burdened to pray like I used to be burdened to pray. I don't, I don't uh, desire holiness and righteousness like I used to desire holiness and righteousness. Well, that, that's not any, it could be nothing more than just complacency in our spirit. A.W. Tozer, I'm going to quote him a lot, said, To have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. Right? So we find God, is the pursuit over? We find God, are we done? Okay, ding, 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 we've rung the bell, we've crossed the gold line, is it over? No, it's not over. I found God, but then I find that in God there's so much to pursue. It's to know him, and this is the cry of Paul, right? This is the cry of Paul in Philippians, and we're going to get to it here in a moment. That I might know him. I found him, but I need to know him. A.W. Tozer, I'm going to quote him again. You ready? (laughs) The world is perishing for lack of knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of his presence. Um, You know, I find find that uh, the church gets to be a little myopic. It gets to be a little self-centered. And what I mean by that is, is the church just needs to be unified. And I don't disagree with that. We, we need to be unified. And that's the prayer of Jesus in John 17, that we be one as he and the Father are one, right? So, so there is this call to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's this, there's this challenge for all of us to walk in the unity of the Spirit of God. But I, how do we do that? How is that possible? Well, if we just pursue unity... And we think it's found in me understanding you and you and you and you and you and you. you. We'll never get there. But think of it this way. 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork 
are automatically tuned to each other. Think about it. So it's not tuning this piano and getting that figured out and then tuning that piano and getting that figured out and, and then they start playing and there's something discordant. And that's how we are. We're like, you need to understand me. You need to know where I'm coming from. Uh, this is not going to probably be popular. But, 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 but if I can get tuned to the tuning fork, Right? And, and you can get tuned, and, and we can get tuned, and we're, we're listening to one thing, and we found our pitch, and we found our tone in Christ. If we can do that, then we automatically start, we, we have this harmony and this tuning to each other. We're trying to find it by what denomination you serve, and what do you believe about this, and what do you believe about that, and we're trying to find it that way. We're never going to find it that way. We gotta, we gotta hit the tuning fork of, fork of Jesus Christ, and we gotta get, we gotta get adjusted and in tune with Him. And once we do, then things begin to bring harmony across the spectrum. So let's go to Philippians three. I don't know. Am I all over the place? It feels like I'm all over the place. I'm still. I got still a little jet lag. So just hang in there with me. Philippians three. Let's read this. We're gonna just read a, a portion of scripture here that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Then you go to verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this. So he's making this affirmation. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him in his power. I want to know him in his sufferings. I want to, I want to, I want to go with him all the way, even to death. And then he says, but I haven't attained this. I'm not there yet. Right? I'm not there yet. Nor am I already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Come on. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. All right, how do I get here? How do I get here? I forget what lies behind, and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on. Toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Woo. All right, how are we doing? So, so where does pursuit come from? This, this whole chapter is about Paul's pursuit of the power of his resurrection, the fellowship, that I want to know him. And I want to know the whole of him. I don't want to know just the comfortable piece. We all love the power of resurrection. Man, I want to know him. I want to know his power. I want to know his glory. I want to see 80, 900 people healed and saved and delivered. I want to see 61,000 come to Christ. We love that one. Come on, I'm in, right? I'm in. Let's do it. But suffer? I want to know him there too. I want to know it when it's popping and it's powerful, and I want to know it when it's hard and it's difficult. I want to know him. And I want to know him not just for a moment. I want to know him until a death calls me. I, I want to finish this thing. Mm. Pursuit is ignited by a sense of more. Oh, a sense of more. Come on. That, that I might, what? That I might know him. I, 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 I might find this. There is more in Christ than what I currently know. Do you think God ran out of himself when he gave you salvation? Do you think God ran out of himself when he filled you with the Holy Spirit? Do you think God ran out of himself when he touched your life? Do you think that God ran out of himself when he performed some miracles in your life? No. God's just getting warmed up. He's just getting started. Heaven is going to be this glorious reality of how God continues to manifest who he is in all the dimensions of who he is. And I, I, I think we pursue when we know there's more. Like, like when you find a nugget of gold in a stream, you don't just take the nugget and go home. No, you go, there's more. Man, if there's one, there's got to be two. If there's two, there's got to be five. If there's five, there's got to be a hundred. And that's why you get the shovel and you sell things and you start digging because you think there's more. If you're digging a hole and all of a sudden you hit something, you hit a dinosaur bone, you got to think there's more. Right? 
And there's got to be something about God when we start digging in, when we discover the reality of who he is. There, there, there's this ignition in us that says, wait a second, there's more. There's more healing. There's more deliverance. There's more breakthrough. There's more victory. There's more glory. There's more presence. There's more power. There's more anointing. There's more. There's more of God. And pursuit's got to come out of that. If you don't believe there's more, you're going to quit pursuing. <laughs> Right? All the, all the NFL teams, I think, I think the Chiefs are still uh, undefeated. By the grace of God. Right? The Royals are doing good. Uh, they kind of got, you know, last night wasn't great. But, but the point is, you know, but what are, they, what, are they, what are they going for? Right? Every team, the more is a Super Bowl trophy. Right? We've had two of those the last couple years. You know, last two years, we're, we're, looking, we're looking for the more. What's the more? Something no other team's achieved. One more, three in a row. Come on, baby, three in a row. They got to play better if they're going to do this. But three in a row. You felt the rebuke for the whole team, didn't you? There's got to be more, right? So, there, so how, do, how, does, how does not achieving the goal of the Super Bowl, why, when is that not enough? Because there's another one. And then there's another one, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. Come on, right? And there's got to be something in us that says God doesn't run out of victories. And God doesn't run out of blessing. There's got to be something in us that believes God's got more. <laughs> that we've, none of us have arrived. None of us have reached the pinnacle of knowledge or understanding or experience. Pursuit not only must be initiated out of the sense of more, but it also has to have a target. you got to be going towards something. Pursuit requires a focus, a targeted focus. And, and so for Paul, what, what are the three targets in his pursuit? I might know him in the power of his resurrection, right? That's his first target. In other words, dunamis, the full, powerful, and explosive power of the new life. Resurrection power isn't just how God saved, brought me from death to life. It is now how I live my life. <laughs> you want to know it's powerful? When I used to get angry, I get sweet. That's powerful. Where I used to be mean, now I'm generous. That's powerful. Right? When I used to be miserable, now I've got joy. That's powerful. And I might know him, I want to know your power, Lord, I want to know your power. Not just as an instrumentality of me accomplishing things so that I can take a little bit of the credit. So I can say, yeah, look at how Lord used me. I want you to be so impressed with how God uses me. If you want to know how God moves today, look at me. What craziness. But there's a lot of people that pursue in power just not because they want God's glory to be revealed. They're pursuing God's power because they want, they want some kind of like special little, you know, little crown over their head. They, they want to be acknowledged as kind of like the source. Yeah, you've tried everybody, now try me. You've had everybody pray, but now let me pray. And not, that, wasn't only, that wasn't Paul's only goal, just to be the expression or to know the power of God, but he also wanted to share in his sufferings. Now, this is an interesting thought. The concept is koinonia, right? It's, it's fellowship. It's the fellowship, the sharing in the struggle, the sharing in the difficulty, the hardship that comes through taking up the cross, as Jesus did. In case you didn't know, and, and some of you, I want to encourage you. This probably does this feel like you're being encouraged at all? I hope so, because because think about this. Do you, do you realize today that when you came to know Jesus and you experienced this incredible deliverance, this incredible victory for your personal life, that then the backside of that is now it's time to pick up your cross and follow Him. That you're called to bear something. 
And sometimes it's not easy serving God. Right? Sometimes family doesn't like it. Friends don't like it. You lose relationships because you're committed to a position of righteousness and other people aren't because it's not culturally accepted. It could be the context of your life. But, and, and whatever degree that is, God's saying, I want you to come into the fellowship of this. Because I, I, I've experienced God, this, this is going to sound maybe a little masochistic, but I, I, I've seen God and the revelation of God in more succinct ways in my suffering than I have in my victories. When things were tough and watching how God brought me through. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying run after it, but I, but I have to understand it's a part of the package. Then the final thing is being conformed unto his death. The idea is that we want to reflect Jesus to the end. I want to model all that he was to the last moment that he took his last breath. And God's saying, I want you, are you willing to bear this all the way to the end? Are you willing to carry this until Jesus takes you home? We don't talk about eternity in these contexts. We don't talk about a significant reality that we're all going to face, save Jesus coming again. That it, it was, am I going to carry this testimony to the end? Am I going to bear it to my last breath? Am I going to be consistent with it? Will I still carry the joy? Will I still carry the blessing? When I'm weak, when I'm feeble, when I'm incapable, will I still demonstrate that God is real? Being dead to the old nature, we reflect the new nature to the end of our journey on earth, right? But this communicates more pursuit, right? Pursuit requires abandonment of the past in all of its forms. He said, I, I, haven't, I haven't achieved this, he says. I haven't achieved this. I haven't, I'm not perfected yet. I haven't quite met the mark. But this one thing I do, forgetting what's behind. Pursuit cannot happen. If I'm clinging to what used to be. In all of its forms. The past in all of its forms becomes a barrier to my pursuit. Right? The past as it relates to the bad. You don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what people have done to me. You don't know how I've been hurt in church. And it becomes a reason why we don't pursue. Because church is where bad things happen. Well... Yes, bad things can happen in church. But good things happen here too. I'm not excusing the bad. I'm not saying it's okay. But there's a lot of humanity in here. With Jesus sprinkled in. Sometimes we kill it and sometimes it kills us. Right? Pursuit requires this this absolute abandonment of my past, the bad past and the good past. You know, I remember when. And we pine for what our experiences were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I want you to know God's not done with experiences, but for some reason we driven our stake and we said, let us just stay here. It, we would have been, we'd be like James, Peter, and, and, and John, where we're seeing the, the transcendent Lord being transfigured on the mountain, and we say, you know what's good for us to hang here? Let's just, let's just pitch our tents here. And God speaks up and says, no. This is, your, this is your moment, this is your experience for today, but you can't anchor to this. Because I got more for you. How can it get any better, God? How can it get any more significant, God? We're watching holy things happen. I mean, Moses is popping up. Elijah's popping up. I mean, Jesus has got glory all around. Him. How can it get any better than this? And God refuses to let them draw their, drive their stakes. He refuses to let them camp there. But we camp. We camp in the good. We camp in the bad. We camp in the comfortable. And God says, no, you got to abandon all the forms of your past. Not, not that you can't learn from them, not that you can't praise God for it, but, but understanding you can't live there. Pursuit requires undeterred focus and commitment and determination. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ. 
man, I'm, I've got my eyes on the prize. I'm, I'm focused. I'm pressing. I'm, I'm determined. I'm committed. I'm making a decision. But here, here's, here's the question. Who's, who's pursuing who? Who's pursuing who? As I shared with you earlier, God is the initiator of pursuit. It starts with him pursuing us. And it ignites something in us to pursue him. John 6 said, no one can come to, the, come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, initiates it. And I will raise him up in the last day. John 12, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will attract people to myself. I will initiate this, this desire to come. I wonder what obscures our heart from pursuing Jesus. Well, if we believe what John 12 says, it's when we're seeing something other than Jesus lifted up. If I'm lifting up success, or if I'm lifting up prosperity, or if I'm lifting up personal comforts, or if I'm lifting up a nationalism, or if I'm lifting up anything other than him, it can literally become the thing that stops me from pursuing him. And the enemy is always trying to put something in the high place. He's always trying to take something and bringing it into the high place, lifting it above Christ. That's why God in the Old Testament had a real problem with high places. Don't, don't go to the Baals in the high places. Don't go into the Ashtaroths in the high places. Don't go there. Don't set up your altars. Why? Because the whole effort of the enemy is to find something and put it on the high place and say, this is what you need to look to. But Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, if I'm lifted up, if what you see is me, it'll cause everybody to be attracted to it. See, the attractional nature of the demonstrated love of God activates our pursuit of God. I love him because he first loved me. I pursue him because he first pursued me. And the process of that pursuit is true spiritual worship. How do I demonstrate pursuit? Well, John 4 tells us says, but the hour's coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship with the Father in what? Spirit and truth. Why? Because that's what the Father's looking for. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So what is God looking for? He's looking for our pursuit. And the mechanism of that pursuit is our authenticated worship towards him. And I'm going to talk about singing songs. Worship is what my life is. We're called to what? Give our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our spiritual act of worship. So it's how I give my life on a daily basis in what I do, how I do it, the way I do it, the mindset I have as doing while I'm doing it. All of this becomes the mechanism by which I demonstrate my pursuit of God. I, I wanna, I'm going to end right here. Um, I want to show you a picture. Hopefully, it's a, this was, I believe, the last family we set free when we were there. I loved this. His name's Emmanuel. Uh, his wife, he's 40 plus years old. His wife and his daughter's 21 ish, 22 ish. She's deaf. We prayed for her. She got hearing in one ear, not complete hearing in the other ear. So we'll just believe that God will complete that. Now, he's sitting on one of the beds. He's got two cots. He's sitting on one of the cots, and the other one's right behind him. This was true of every family we delivered from the Bricklands. They had a cot or two uh, as their possessions. Uh, how many's ever moved from your house? U-Hauls, multiple 
family members, people with pickup trucks. This is all that they own. Two cots, a bundle of bedding, a small little uh, box, for lack of a better term, of pots and pans. And that's it. That's the whole of their life. 40 years of life, and it amounts to something that he, his wife, and his daughter can carry out in one single trip. Now, the reason why I'm showing Emmanuel to you is because <clears throat> Emmanuel was born, the father was born in the bricklayers, 40 years. He had inherited the debt of his father. He watched his mother die in the Bricklands. He watched his father die in the Bricklands. He watched his siblings die in the Bricklands or go to other Bricklands. He met his wife in the Bricklands. He had his child in the Bricklands. His whole life was only slavery. It's all he knew. It was the reality of his life, and there's little hope that it would ever change. But two weeks ago, God moved on a church in Olathe, Kansas. No, you got to stay with me here. And some of you gave extravagantly. And some of you gave the best you could. Some of you couldn't do much, but you did what you felt led to do. Thank God. And then a bald, fat guy from Olathe got in a plane and flew 20 hours in a plane and finally got to Lahore and on the last day he was in country, he goes to the Brickland where he had been identified by the team and the team chose him to be one of the families that would be set free. He didn't know I existed. He didn't know our church existed. He didn't know we'd have the resource to free him. He's living life, and he's only living in the hope that Jesus could possibly give him something new for his life. He wouldn't have known how to write us or I am us, to reach us, to call us. He had no means to do it. No capability whatsoever to initiate something from us that would cause us to free him. But God, in his infinite wisdom, his incredible scope of omniscience, moved upon the hearts of this team as well as VLI, which is Pastor Ed Exer's team, and we came up with enough money, and we, we not because I knew him, not because I knew where he was, not because I knew what his situation was. Not because we had some spectral understanding or a word from the Lord. No, we're just going because God said go. And we're just doing because God said do. And, and we're just being sacrificial because God said to be sacrificial. And God takes the desire to satisfy the need of somebody who has never known anything but bondage. And coordinate it with somebody who's willing to do something about it. And in his infinite mercy, these guys show up. And in literally 15 minutes, his life is totally changed. It's totally changed. I'm watching them drive away. <laughs> with smiles and laughter and waving. Because 20 minutes ago, they didn't know this was an option. And it reminds me of Jesus. And where was I? I was in my slavery. I was in my pit. I didn't know anything else but sin and death. That's all I knew. I didn't know there was another option. I didn't know there was another way. I didn't know there was another hope. But Jesus came, and he came for me. And he saw me in my bondage, and he saw me in my slavery. And he paid the, paid the debt I, I owed, and I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I, there was nothing I could do. I was laboring, and I was working, but I could never get myself free. And then Jesus came, and he paid it for me. And 
and he put me on a new life, and he put me in a new reign, and he gave me a new hope, and he's restored my soul, and he gave me a victory that nobody else could have given me. I'm here to tell you, somebody's pursuing us. Somebody's pursuing us. Somebody's pursuing us. Pray for this family as they start a new life, a life they're unfamiliar with, a life that is completely foreign to them. Will they have struggles? You know it. Will it be difficult? Sure. Will there be times, will there be like the Egyptians, or excuse me, like the children of Israel, and they'll say, you know what? It's hard out here. It's hard out here being responsible for myself. Let me go back to the brick ones where I don't have to worry about raising the money to feed myself. And I've got a place, I've got a hole to live in. And I get a little bit of rice every day. But Jesus says, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage to unbelief. But live in the freedom wherewith Christ has made you free. Who's pursuing who? Are we pursuing him or is he pursuing us? Or if why am I pursuing him is because he's pursuing me. Stand your feet, would you? I'm sorry, I'm I'm emotional. I feel a little disjointed. Holy Spirit, here we are. Uh, I, I realize, I, I don't know if this is translating to the hearts of people in this room or watching online. I pray today that you will ignite something in us to pursue you. Lord, if we become complacent, if we become self absorbed, if we become me focused, me and mine focused, and not thinking about the greater call and victory that comes because of what you've done for us. Lord, we owe you everything. You did everything for us. Just like Emmanuel and his family, there was no way they could work themselves out of this. They were living in the debt of their ancestors. Lord, just like we lived in the debt of our ancestors spiritually. But then you sent Jesus. And he, in a minute, with his own blood, wiped out my debt. And he gave me his life so that I can now live new. And I don't know where people are in this room, but if you're here today and you've never met that, you've never experienced that, you've never accepted that, can I promise you, you can keep working and laboring and trying to get yourself out. But why don't you just accept that you can't and know that Jesus did. And just put your faith in him. So Lord, I thank you that you're you're moving in our hearts today. And that as we pray, as we enter this time of just seeking you, worshiping you, that we'll give generously, we'll do communion and fellowship with one another, valuing what you've done for us, and that we'll pray one for another. And if there are those here today that have never accepted you or want to come home, that they'll come forward and, and just let us minister to them. Lord, we're trusting you for that great work, even now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Would you do something? Would you lift your hands in real gratitude and thanksgiving and just and just declare how grateful you are for what Jesus has done for you? Would you just tell him how wonderful he is for doing what he's done for you and me? Just thank him. Thank him with a sincere heart today. Just thank him with a sincere heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's worship him.